Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see you here at Broadway Baptist Church. There's not a better place to be at 845 on a Sunday morning than right here. So, did any of you go to the ball game last night? I'm just curious. There was one or two, I know. Well, whatever. <laughs> now, some of you are fanning out there. If we turn the temperature down, you tell us, say, it's too cold, and if we don't do it, you know, whatever. We're going to have a great time of worship today. Those of you who are visiting with us, we're glad you're here, and we're glad everyone's here. It's going to be a great time together. This opening song is actually a little chorus. It's called, I Love You with the Love of the Lord. I Love You with the Love of the Lord. We're going to sing it twice so you'll get to know it. Choir, you stand, please. You all remain seated and just kind of pay attention to how this song goes the first time. And then we'll all sing it together the second time. Here we go. someone in this church family, not a spouse or a child or a grandchild or a parent, someone in this church family that's meant a lot to you, a Sunday school teacher, a friend, whoever it may be, and think of that person as we sing it again. Now everyone sing together. Here we go. Two, three. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you. Share with that person 
wherever, or, you know, whoever they are, that you thought of them while we sang that song. Would you do that? We're going to sing it one more time as we stand this time, and we're going to sing this song and in the family of God. Uh, I love you with a love of the Lord. Yes, I love you. about Natalie Sisters. Um, Natalie Sisters is a Christian organization here in Lexington, and just like that song we sang, they are here to share the love of the God. And they do that, they provide food, they provide love, they provide resources for women who have had some sort of abuse. It could be um, any, any kind of trauma, so childhood sexual um, abuse, it could be physical abuse, trafficking, prostitution, rape, anything like that, they are here to, to provide resources and love without any sort of judgment. They have a drop-in um, center where they can go and they can get food, they can get toiletries, they can get um, help with resources, you know, um, to help them to get out of this trafficking and, and prostitution. And they also go into the clubs. They have a team that goes into clubs and they take them a hot meal and they also take them resources and they do that. And they say the women ask, why are you doing this? And it's because they love them and they wanna form relationships with them. And by doing this, they can show them the love of God and help them get out of this and help them to get re be restored to their families, be restored to God. And um, so Sandy's gonna tell you about the different items that we are collecting here as a church. Good morning. So here at the church, here's what we can do to help them and to support them. So we are collecting donations of, and it's in the bulletin, peanut butter crackers, the protein bars, tuna or, sal or chicken salad packets, kits, the kits, um, chips, crackers, nuts, candy bars, fruit cups, toothpaste, toothbrushes, deodorant, soap, and shampoo. We also have bins down at the uh, lower section where we can get those too and collect them. So we appreciate all the care and the love that you all give the women's ministry, plus everyone that we ask for donations for. We appreciate you all. Thank you.
fall like rain. Isn't that a wonderful text? Showers are blessing. We've had some showers, and we're going to have some more. And inside this room, there are showers of blessing. Let's sing it together. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. Savior of
gracious and holy Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We tell people we love you. We sing the songs. But Father, you loved us first. Father, you loved us so much you gave your Son to die in our place that we might be washed clean like the rain washes clean the sins from our lives. And Father, we are so grateful, and you ask us to give a portion of what you've given us. And this morning, Father, as we give tithes and offerings, may it be a blessing to those around. Father, may your word be carried forth, your good news, to those who need to hear the gospel message. Father, we thank you for your abundant giving, your abundant love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
the blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches. And it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. It soon doubts and calms my fears and it dries all, all of my tears oh the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never And then it goes to the lowest valley of oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose. It will never song. That is absolutely true. It does not lose its power with that. A wonderful song here in worship. Parents, I want to remind everybody, if we you have children, we are at this point now in our worship service for Children's Church. So Ms. Sarah Rios is going to stand up over here. If there are any children who would like to go to Children's Church at this time, they will stand up and they will follow Miss Sarah over here down to Children's Church and then they head straight into Sunday school uh, right after that. Any children going to children's church? We are coming up. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to the New Testament book of Galatians. You say, preacher, I thought we were going through the book of Acts. We are, but we're going to be looking. I'm going to tell you all what this section of Acts is. I'm going to actually, uh, this will be the shift from Peter to Paul. 
And we're coming up, while you turn there, we're coming up on an exciting time for our church. We're about to enter a period of outreach. And next Sunday, we kick off our 40 days of outreach. So you will have these prayer guides as well. They'll have scripture you can be praying for. And not only that, reminders to be looking for the outreach opportunities that are surrounding us all the time. And this passage here is going to speak to that, of shifting from thinking like Paul, thinking like a missionary, beginning to open up your eyes and look for what God is doing all around you so you can certainly be a great witness uh, to those. Two weeks from this Sunday is what we call National Back to Church Sunday. And that's a national day. It's on uh, the third Sunday of September every year. And it's a great time to invite someone Maybe who used to go to church, who doesn't go to church, or maybe, I mean, even today, if you're a a Kentucky football fan, you get a gold star in heaven if you're here this morning. Have you ever seen those West Coast games that start at 10 o'clock at night? You're thinking, who on earth stays up to 10 o'clock at night to watch football? Well, that happened down the road from here. We had a 10 o'clock game, and then I actually stayed up. Uh, And then at midnight, you all know they stopped the game again. I mean, it, it, it... if they would have restarted, this game would go to like 2 o'clock in the morning. It just keeps on going. It's, it's the middle of the, the moon shining, and you're in the middle of the night playing football back and forth. No, probably no fans. Uh, if there were, you couldn't have picked a more miserable day to have a football game. Pouring down rain, lightning everywhere, 2 a.m. I mean, it would just be a challenging situation to play football in those circumstances. But um, if, if, if you know somebody, it may be... They haven't been going to church because they're staying up late watching football or they've gotten out of the habit. National Back to Church Sunday is a time to invite them. We're always looking for opportunities to invite folks to say, hey, you come, come to 845 worship service early on Sunday morning here at Broadway. That is an, an invite that we certainly want to extend to people we know. And uh, two weeks from this Sunday is a great Sunday to do that. So what we're looking at here in our Bibles is, well, this is a passage I know I've been looking forward to it because this is many ways is what we call the Catholic to Protestant shift. It's moving from Peter to Paul. You know, if you ever hear that uh, statement, you rob Peter to pay Paul, all this ties into uh, Roman Catholicism to our uh, Protestant Reformation. You know, you think about the two most prominent churches in the world, uh, uh, there in the, uh, St. Peter's Basilica, that's where the head of the Catholic Church is located in Rome, with St. Peter's his name. Then the head of the Protestant Church would be a St. Paul's in London. So you can see it right there by the two, those two, the St. Paul's Cathedral, th- those two shifts. And we're about to see how Martin Luther, in uh, 500 years ago, he was a Roman Catholic priest in Germany, in Wittenberg, Germany, and he realized. You know, the Catholic Church here is teaching a works-based salvation where you earn favor with God. And here in our Bibles, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul is going to rebuke Peter for that very sin. He had gone back to trying to please God by following the law. And many of you say, Pastor, this does not apply to me. I don't try to please God by following the law. But I believe if we look at our life and we look at our actions, we will find areas of our life and some of the things we do are the attitudes we have of trying to earn God's favor. For example, we might believe that giving is a way. If you give, you know, we're commanded to give. We give because we're saved. We don't give to earn our salvation or earn favor or to please God by giving. We might think that we uh, come to church and Sunday school and Wednesday night Bible study to please God by patting ourselves on the shoulder and say, look what I do, God. I'm doing this while all these other people, they don't do it. And that's why I'm going to invite them to National Back to Church Sunday because they're not here and I'm here. And it's an attitude of smugness of thinking, God, I'm just a cut above better than other people. And what happens in our life, we look at people and, and we might, you might have the tendency of you Christianity as a bunch of rules of don't do this, don't drink this, 
don't say this, don't use these type of words, don't watch these type of movies, and if you do these things, then you earn favor with the Lord. And that is not the case at all. We're going to see one of the most profound statements that has been made by Paul in the Bible here, how he has been crucified with Christ. That means what Jesus did on the cross, we died with Jesus. And by us trusting in the Lord, that is what it means for us to be pleasing to the Lord, that we have placed our trust and our hope in Him. And it's nothing that we ourselves do. So what happened here? This shift from Peter to Paul. And what's amazing about this story is in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 15, Peter drifts away. Acts chapter 15, um, I don't want you to turn there. I'm just going to tell you what is ha- happening here. So much of the early church, the way it started out, it was led by Peter. I mean, you see that with Pentecost. You see that with the early preaching in the temple. You see this with the gospel going to the Samaritans. And then it goes through Cornelius, like we looked at last week, to the Gentiles. Peter was all part of that, with the Holy Spirit coming down and uh, all different peoples come and know the Lord. And then what happened, they had this business meeting. It was called the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. And the business meeting was about, do Jews uh, or do Gentiles, when they get saved, do they have to get circumcised and follow these Jewish laws in the Old Testament? Like, what are we expecting these new believers to do? And what what Peter spoke up, This was really a high point in his life. He spoke up and says, we don't want to put a yoke on the people. They come to to faith in Christ just as I am, just as they are, and then Christ saves them. And that saving faith in Christ is all that God requires of us. It's not, we we don't bring anything to the Lord ourselves. There's nothing we do to please God. What, what pleases the Lord is coming to the Lord and says, God, I trust you with my life. And Lord, I can't please you myself, Lord. It's through your, what your son did on the cross, through the power of the blood, and by receiving and believing in that blood, that is my salvation. So then what happened was the Christian church was based in the early days in Jerusalem. But persecution broke out. And, and the Jews that did not believe and did not like Christians and the Pharisees, they began persecuting Christians in Jerusalem. So the, the headquarters of the church, it went north into an area called Antioch. It's current day Syria. Used, before war broke out, you used to be able to tour, Christian, take Christian tours there. You can't do that anymore. It's not safe to go to Syria. And um, you, you, they were in that region. And what happened was um, that was the launching center for these missionary journeys that Paul began to take. And Peter would travel up there as well because the Christians had to leave. Well, Peter goes up there and he's up among all these Gentiles because this is a Gentile area. And he's dining, and he's moving amongst them. He's eating with them. He's eating their types of food. Peter's just acting like another Gentile, although he's very Jewish. And then one day, some people from the party of James, that meant they were, James was the leader of the um, Jerusalem church. They sent some representatives up to Antioch. Well, Peter saw these Jewish guests show up from Jerusalem. They had traveled a couple hundred miles up there to visit them. Well, all of a sudden, he grabbed his plate of food and he grabbed his chair and he went to another room and he went back to separating himself himself, and began practicing this Gentile Jewish separation. And that's where we're going to pick up here. Paul witnessed this. And what was amazing is when Peter started doing this, one of, one of the dangers of hypocrisy is when we find ourselves falling into sin, we can lead other believers into that sin. And they will tr- follow along with us. And that's what Peter did. Barnabas, who was a leader of the church, who went on Paul's missionary journey, 
he began to separate himself too. And Paul saw this and go, whoa, 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 this is hypocrisy. We are long past that. We settled this at the business meeting in Acts chapter 15 with the Jerusalem council. We had, we had decided this is what the Lord wants to do. And now you're going back to the old way. This is like you and your family and your church family. You decide one, one decision. We're going in this direction. And then six months or a year later, some visitors show up or some different people come in town and you go back to the old way because that's not what the Lord led us to do. We don't, we don't make a U-turn halfway through the project. All right? we, you don't make a change of plans as you're following the Lord's direction just because some different people came. And Paul is going to speak out against Peter. And I want to tell you, this actually ended Peter's uh, active ministry in the Bible because of what he did here. By him going back to reverting to his old way of life, Paul takes off, and it becomes all about Paul because Paul is teaching salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Even if you're a Jew, a Gentile, whatever your background is, you trust in Jesus, and that is all that it requires to please the Lord. All of us here today want to please God. And we have to, we have to remove this works-based, law-thinking, uh, action-based uh, plan that we think we please the Lord. We come to the Lord, He looks at our heart, and He says, Daniel loves the Lord. This guy has a passion to please me. He's not trying to do it himself. He's trusted in my son. So I want you to turn your Bibles here. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Cephas, that is Peter here. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Wow! That is the leader of the church right there. That's the chairman of the disciples. That is Jesus' right-hand man, Peter. He is the one who, who Jesus selected, called from the Sea of Galilee. So you're going to be fishing for people. But that season's about to end in Peter's life right here because of this. Paul is saying, I opposed him publicly. And the reason he opposed him publicly is because the sin that Peter was doing was public. Publicly, he was leading the other believers away. And Paul opposed him publicly. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. That's the, the Jerusalem church. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. That's the Jews. Peter had preached against doing this in Acts chapter 15, verse 10. He says you cannot, you, you don't have to do this anymore. You cannot be a believer and start separating yourselves and make this distinction because in God's eyes there's no distinction. But now Peter is making a distinction. And I think for us, you know, so much of what, when we hear the word hypocrisy, hypocrisy is when we publicly say one thing. And we we're say, this is who I am. But then publicly we're going out doing the opposite thing. And it, 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 the two don't line up. And you're saying, wait a minute, you're saying this out loud, and you're doing this out. I mean, these are totally opposite. And that's what, that's what Peter's doing here. He's what we would call, a, he's what Paul's calling a hypocrite. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy. So even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. That's the danger of hypocrisy, because other people will start to follow you. And this, that certainly occurred here. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas, Peter, in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Now that's a difficult statement uh, to, to read. So what, what that really means is he's saying it's dangerous. It's a dangerous sin here, because what you're doing is you're asking people publicly to, uh, 
to come to Christ as one. But now, all of a sudden, these Gentiles, you're separating yourselves from them. It's this divided life. He's saying, Peter, how can you say this when this is a divided issue that you're making right here? When we come to Christ, Jesus looks at us and He tells us, your sins are forgiven. That's all we want from the Lord. He doesn't look at us and say, I'm so proud of your works and what you've done and how you've earned this and how good you were and uh, the things that you have excelled and you've scored this on a scorecard. You know, we, we, it's not like we're, we get a report card from the Lord. He looks at us and says, you're forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. You are forgiven. And what happens, because we are forgiven, and Christ is the Lord of our life, what that means is now, out of His Lordship in my life, I serve and I love and I give and I go, and I'm a witness, I'm doing that not to earn my salvation, I do that because I'm saved. There's a radical difference between those two. I'm not pleasing God. So if there's a day that in 40 days of outreach, say on day 17, you do zero outreach, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't even think about doing outreach. You don't even read your devotion. You don't even do your, read a Bible verse that day. You forget to pray. We don't lose our salvation because we missed a day. What we, what we, we do lose something. We, we lose a day of communion with the Lord and we lose a day of missed opportunity with the Lord. Now, we'll never capture that. That's a missed day in our life. So there could have been witnessing opportunities on day 17 and you'll never get them again. You just go on to eight, day 18 and keep moving along. So that's what happens as a believer. But we, don't, we can't do 40 days and say, well, gosh, Lord, I, I, I was a witness. I did outreach every single day for 40 days. I get a gold star in heaven. God looks upon me more favorably. I'm better than other people. That's not the attitude that we're to have here. Paul is condemning Peter. He's saying this, you're saying one thing, Peter, Yet how are we going to compel these people? How can we expect Gentiles to come to faith in Christ if really you're just going to ask them to live like Jews? You're saying all that matters is faith in Christ, but now they have to go get circumcised and they have to separate themselves when they eat, uh, eat, eat with other people. He said that's not what Jesus told us to do. Keep going here in your, in your Bible. Now hear what Paul's going to do. And here's, I want to tell you, this is the Protestant Reformation where it comes from right here. Because what's going to happen? This is the shift from Roman Catholicism to being Protestant by salvation, by faith alone. How to please God. That is the ultimate question how all every human on earth is asking. They might not be asking it publicly, but inside their life they're thinking, who do I live for? What what do I live for? How do I earn happiness? How do I uh, uh, acquire favor? And the answer is coming right here. This, this verses 15 through 21 is Scripture that we should constantly be dwelling on. And the reason it's so powerful is because Paul witnessed what Peter just did. He's saying, you're going back to your old way of life, separating yourselves, going back to circumcision and separation and, and dining restrictions. But that's not what it means to receive the new birth in Christ. Verse 12, or verse 15. We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet, because we know that a person... So, Paul just acknowledged, yes, we're, we're, we're actually Jewish by birth. That means that's who my lineage is. Yet, because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, Even we ourselves have believed in Jesus Christ. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. So we're not we're we're justified solely by faith in Christ. Justification is the main theme of our salvation. Justified is when the Lord looks at us and says, You are forgiven. You're forgiven. That's what he says. 
You're forgiven. Go and sin no more. He looks at us and says, you no longer stand condemned. Christ stands in your place. So when we're judged, when, Christ, when we stand before the Lord, it's the Lord. He covers us. His sins, or what He did on the cross, covers our sins. So the Lord doesn't see our sin as a sinner's. He sees us as forgiven. We've been saved by His faith. Folks, that is all it requires for salvation. Justification by faith alone. Justified is you're standing before a judge and he declares you not guilty. You're not a sinner. You're innocent. You're not condemned. That's what it means by this. The old statement means just as if you've never sinned. But there's a problem with that statement, just as if you've never sinned. We have sinned. Christ removes our sins from us, or He has removed our sins from us. And it's once and for all. So it goes on to say here, um, verse 17, but if we ourselves are also found to be sinners while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things that I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. He's saying here, why would I sit here and go to the Jerusalem council and preach against doing this, and here I am building back up these walls? That's like us saying you've been saved out of some type of sin that you wrestled with for a long time, and the Lord saved you from that sin. And then for whatever reason, you decided you were going to go back to that sin, and you were leading other people that sin, and you were trying to justify that sin. And he's saying, when you do that, what you're doing is you have rebuilt the, this, this sin area of your life. And then you're trying to justify it. He says, you don't do that. You have to recognize Christ tore that down. He removed that from you. That's no longer your identity. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Paul saying, you now, you live for the Lord. That's, that's, what, a, what freedom we have. That statement there. I live for God. It says, I no longer live to please other people. I no longer live to please these things. I just live for the Lord. In fact, I actually said that this week. I had to go to our children's orientation at their school. And orientation is where all these parents go and they listen to speeches by the teachers. You, you've all gone through this. And you get like some books and some handouts. And it's just all sorts of moms, dads, some grandparents are there. And I was our family's representative. And it goes on and on and on. And they go over this rule book and the handbook. And, I, and you go and meet the teachers. And in one of the classes, because after the class is over, you have to go and get these handouts. So I was going to this event. And you're, I know on Sunday mornings my clothes might match. But on Monday night, my clothes didn't match. You know, you, you, and I've learned, you don't wear patterned pants and then a separate patterned shirt. Like, y'all know that. That's what you don't wear. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you're walking out the door, and you're like, look, I'm just going to orientation. I'm picking up papers and books and pens and notebooks. Like, who am I trying to impress? These are just parents who don't want to be there. That's what this is. We all know it. So I'm there standing in line, and this lady who I would call a hippie. She, is, she was a different type of person. She was behind me. And I don't get a, com a lot of compliments on how I dress. And she made a compliment and said, Sir, I really like your outfit. <clears throat> and like women don't, don't typically say that to me, especially, especially in that setting. And I said, Ma'am, I'll just live for the Lord. I'm not trying to impress any women. I just show up here. I'm just getting the papers. And if this is what I look like, this is what I look like. You know, I think about that. That is exactly what Paul is saying right here. I live for God. I'm not trying to impress anybody else. I live for God. If this is who I am, this is who I am. Paul's saying, I have died to the law. I'm no longer that person. So that means when you walk down the hallway, when you have been crucified to Christ and you live for God, this is what it looks like. When this church service is over, over, you walk down that hallway and say, God, I'm going to walk down this hallway. You put someone in my path who I can encourage, 
Put someone in my path who I can pray for. Put someone in my path who I can say, it is so good to see you today. It's, it's a blessing to be here at church. Even when they say something negative, you respond with something positive because you've been crucified with Christ. You don't live for this world. Your home is in heaven. This is what it means to please God. You go to the bank tomorrow or on Tuesday and you're thinking, I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to see somebody who doesn't go to church and I'm going to invite them to church. If they cuss me out because they don't like the Lord, that's not on me. I'm just doing the outreach. I can't control what they say. All I do is I live for God. That is what Paul is saying to please the Lord. So everything you do throughout your life, whether it's here or there or wherever, you're saying, I live for God. If people don't like me, I, I just, I'm here to please the Lord. That is an attitude. Peter was trying to go back to his old ways of life to please the Jews in Jerusalem. And Paul said, Peter, you can't do it. That's not who you're trying to please. You're trying to please God. That's who we want to impress. That's who we want to gain favor with. That's who the object of our faith is. And look at this next verse. Look at verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. I have died with Christ. That meant Paul saying, I also, I died on that cross too. I'm no longer a selfish man. When I go outside, I'm going to look for somebody and we have them all here all the time with a flat tire so I can get an opportunity to help change their tire so ultimately I could tell them about Jesus. That's what it means to be crucified with Christ. If people are waiting on me and I'm doing the Lord's work, oh well, I'm just doing the Lord's work. I'm trying to please Him. That means you have died to selfishness. You are living for other people and for the Lord. It's a totally different aspect on life. Verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no, longer, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is one of the most profound statements in Scripture. That's teaching us who our very being of who we are, we have died with Jesus on the cross. Everything about ourself is about selfishness. Everything in our culture teaches us to live for ourselves, to do what pleases us, to... to do whatever to make you happy. And here, Jesus is telling us, Paul's writing the shift from Peter to Paul. No, you have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, but you live in Christ. Christ lives in you. Look at this last verse here. Verse 21. It tells us here, um, The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, that means if salvation comes through the law, if we're able to please God through the law, then Christ died for nothing. But listen folks, Christ didn't die for nothing. He died so we can be saved. And this morning I ask you, have you been crucified with Christ? And if we are trying, it's, it's a fundamental question. It says, Lord, am I, am I daily trying to please you? Because the only way to please the Lord is by saying, I'm no longer going to live this selfish life. I do things that I don't want to do. I have awkward conversations that I normally wouldn't have. I'm put in positions to speak up when everyone else is going this direction. I'm going this direction. When everyone else is talking like this, I talk like this. That's what it means. I have died. You have Being a Christian is different. And I think about Paul, what he's doing right here. He's preaching a sermon. Say, who's, who's the recipient of this sermon right here in Galatians chapter 2, these last few verses? It was Peter. He's actually telling Peter, He's all the other disciples. Guys, here's why we don't do this. I'm sure, and Peter at this point, I bet he was embarrassed, but the Bible records no response from him. He was the leader of the disciples. And now, at this, this section of Scripture was the turning point that the church shifted from Peter to Paul because of this. 
Paul understood salvation. He understood how to please the Lord. He understood the statement, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. It's no longer about me. And this morning I ask you, when we look at our life and say, Lord, am I struggling with selfishness? Am I trying to please you by doing things? This is at the heart of salvation. Lord, I, the only way I can please you is, is what the Bible says right here, that I live for you and have accepted your son, Jesus, by faith on the cross. That is it. That is the simple faith in Christ that saves us. And the perfect example of that in all the Bible who placed his faith in Jesus was the thief on the cross. He was right there hanging next to Jesus. And he looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. I believe in you, Jesus. I'm a criminal. What I did, I deserve this punishment. But this man here, he has done nothing wrong. And Jesus looked at him. Now that man didn't get baptized. That man didn't get one chance to do any good works. He didn't get to go around witnessing. He didn't get to participate in 40 days of outreach. Jesus looked at that man and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. That reminds us, even on our deathbed, even at the point of death, even if you're dying. Do you know anybody dying? Do you know anybody in hospice care right now? If you do, you need to be witnessing to them. Last conversations that we have with folks who are dying needs to be about Jesus. It doesn't need to be about Kentucky football or basketball. There's a lot, it doesn't need to be about politics. Those might be good things to talk about, but that's not eternal consequences. It needs to be about their relationship with the Lord. That's what matters. And what happens here is we want to walk out of here this morning and say, I live for God. I've been crucified with Christ. No matter what happens, my hope, my hope, home, and ultimately my salvation for eternity is with the Lord. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their head. I say, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Because when, you preach, when I preach a sermon here about being crucified with Christ and faith in Christ, this is a salvation message. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And this, this morning, some of you here, you, you see this message and you read these words that Paul wrote. For though for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. This morning, if you believe you're not living for God, if you're living for any other things of this world, and there's so many other things, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want you to have the opportunity to get saved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to pray this prayer, and you pray along with me. Dear Lord, I'm here to live for you. I'm dying to sin. I'm crucifying my old life. Lord, I'm nailing it to the cross. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Lord, remove the selfishness from me. Jesus, from now, I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to look up. The Bible teaches us if we confess our sins, and we place our faith in Him, we are saved. That is salvation. It's no accident here that this is uh, where Peter, where all of a sudden, when he went back to his old way of life, he drifted away. And Paul is on the rising star now. And he's about to go on all these missionary journeys and take the gospel to the whole world, ultimately all the way up to us. But because he understood what it meant to be saved by faith alone, And how we please God solely through Christ alone. That is the most important aspect of our life. And I want to invite everyone to stand up. And if you got saved and you said that prayer, and you trusted in Christ as your Savior this morning, I'm going to stand down front, and I want you to respond and say, Pastor, I want to take your hand. I want to make it public. I want to be a public follower of Jesus. I'm tired of living in the shadows. I'm tired of living a life as a hypocrite. Lord, I'm here for you. This morning, we're going to respond to God. We're going to sing hymn number 544. Have thine own way, Lord. I stand down front. You respond to Jesus this morning.
Sunday school. It's about starting in a few minutes. I know we have guests here this morning on, on Labor Day weekend. Uh, we have our guest uh, welcome center back there. You want to go back to our welcome center and find your Sunday school class. Also, if you're a guest, we have our little connection cards in the pew. You can fill it out and place it in our black box there at the welcome center and you can, uh, get on our church email list and find out activities and events, some of the things going on here. Um, uh, t- this is Labor Day weekend, so normally we do Sunday evening worship, but we don't on Labor Day weekend because opportunity for you to spend time with your family, so there's no evening worship tonight. We'll be back here at church on Wednesday night, and then uh, we've got to start next Sunday, and the weeks after that, it's going to get really busy. A lot of wonderful outreach opportunities coming up. You'll be learning about all of those things uh, very soon with everything. So it's an exciting time here at Broadway. Great time to be looking for folks uh, to, um, uh, to invite as well as to prepare to grow spiritually for that. So uh, we're going to have a closing song, and then we are headed to Sunday school. We are. We're going to sing Leaning on Jesus. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all of 